Station. I can't get no call to action, but I try and I try and I try. Hello and, and try. welcome to Call to Action, the go to podcast for anyone trying to make sense of the world of marketing, advertising, and beyond. In an industry that is a minefield of utter bollocks, we aim to capture our heroes and allies from the front line to have a chinwag with. It's like Pokemon Go, with the single but vital exception that it's not a short-term bandwagon of shite. It's brought to you by Gasp, and I'm Giles Edwards, co-founder and MD. Today I've caught John Lyons. Currently living the mini brick-building dream as senior loyalty proposition manager at the Lego Group, John has both a brilliant marketing brain and an alarmingly dirty mind. He has over 20 years experience delivering marketing strategies, campaigns, promotions and content programs for agencies, startups and brands, including the BBC, Lego, Fame, Flynet and Entertainment One. He's also a trained architect former Shoreditch DJ, who never forgot about Dre, hat adventurer, bin documenter, and long-time friend of the show. John says technology might shortcut some process, but it does not radically change how human beings decide what they're going to spend their money on. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you, Giles. Thanks for having me. Well, that's, that's yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten half of those things. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the hat and the bin. Well, yeah, the hat and the bin, I mean, which is clearly the only reason I'm here. Are you wearing the hat now? I'm, I'm not wearing the hat, no, because, no, I'm not wearing the hat. I don't wear the hat indoors, um, but I, I, I did wear the hat out earlier when I took my son to school, and I'll be wearing it again later when I go and pick him up. Hat's resting. Cool. Okay, mate, <laughs> let's do our seven quick fire questions. So, number one, beer or wine? Uh, as a recently diagnosed diabetic, it's wine. Uh, number two, Ritson or Sharp? Oh, man. Um, I'm not going to sit on the fence. I'm going to go for Ritson because I know that Ritson does have respect for Sharp and what he did. So I I think Sharp can fit into Ritson world. Yeah, that's fair. Marketing specialists or marketing generalists? Oh, baby. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, This is a tricky one for me because um, I, I have the utmost respect for specialists. Um, and I, one of the, one of the bugbears of the industry for me is that specialists aren't kind of given the respect sometimes they should have for their speciality. And we kind of almost treat the tacticians as dumb and the, the strategists as smart, but I'm very happy to be a generalist having spent about 20 years as, as various type of specialist. Very good point. Well made. Uh, number four, hats or bins? Oh, I, I think hats. There's only, there's only one that I'd put on my head. Right, we've got three more. Millennium Falcon or Batwing? It's a Lego-based one. <laughs> Where did that come from? How, how, how do you know that I have both of them in my background in my office? <laughs> we have eyes, mate. Oh, you, you must do. Um, I, I, I got to say that the, the 1989 Batwing is, is, is the best Lego set I've put together so far. Nice, nice. I wonder what Jerry Dakin thinks of that. I might have to ask him if he doesn't hear this. Uh, okay, two more. <laughs> Uh, James Blunt or Ed Sheeran? Oh, man. Um, to be fair to Ed Sheeran, he does know how to put together a tune, but James Blunt wins it for Twitter. He's, yes, he's, he's, he's a king on Twitter. That. He gets right on my tits and finishes in your mouth. One of the best <laughs> tweets of all time. Yes. <laughs> and finally, uh, Call to Action or other marketing podcasts? Oh, mate, come on, you know. You know it's Call to Action. My, my all-time favourite <laughs> pod. And... Um, you know, kind of here, here I am now, kind of just for a little moment, blowing smoke up your ass. All time favorite pod. Absolutely delighted to, to be here. Um, love it. Never miss it. Thanks, mate. Well, that's enough of that. So as a long time listener, um, dare I say fan of the show, I hope you know that we start every episode by asking guests to elaborate on their linear and more often than not, not so linear paths. So judging by the fact you studied and trained as an architect, I'd assume you fall into the latter, not so linear, wiggly category. Um, so what was your first ever job? And then what was your first proper marketing gig? Well, yeah, no, it's absolutely completely a linear. But so my, my, my first job was, um, it was actually when I was studying architecture. So I, 
I wasn't setting the world alight, but I was decent. And um, but I sort of managed to raise my head above the parapet and um, call out some senior members of the school ar- hierarchy. And uh, so I I wasn't I I didn't didn't get to pass my second year, uh, which my work was good enough to do. Um, this was back in the days of grants, and um, I found out that by due of being probably the the person from the poorest background at university, I was the only one whose local authority wasn't going to support me with a, a grant to reset. So um, all, of, all of this kind of worked out quite well because I got angry, uh, but I, I got a job as a cleaner. So I worked that summer and continued to work part time for, for the next year or two, actually, until I graduated um, as a cleaner at the House of Parliament. Um, and sometimes toilet attendant at Hyde Park. So um, that that was that was fun. <laughs> it was interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I to be honest, kind of having pretty much an access all areas pass at Houses of Parliament was pretty special. Although a lot of the times what I was doing was chasing changing bog paper or picking up broken wine bottles. Um, but at one point, I I kind of had the cover shift between the day shift and the night shift, so I had to go everywhere. And as a as an architect or a student architect at the time, I, I got to study the whole building. I got I got to go up, got to go up Big Ben or you know, kind of the the the, the tower. Or I had to vacuum all the bloody stairs, but I did get to go up there. That was fun. And I I got to wander around all of the tunnels where um, Guy Fawkes kind of um, got captured because we had our storage cupboards down there. But it it was it was it was amazing. Wow. It was kind of really eye opening and and for me it. It was actually a good lesson in some ways because there were people there who were bright. There were people there who were brighter than uh, people I I knew at university who just didn't have the life choices. They didn't have the opportunities. And um, yeah, one guy in particular, Michael Haig, kind of took me under under his wing a little bit. And he was such a bright guy. But, you know, he he had three kids that his wife had from a previous relationship. He worked 12 hours a day, didn't eat lunch. Mm -hmm. And that that was that was the life he had to he had to live. And, you know, I I kind of decided that this is my opportunity to really make 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 a go of it. I need to save up every penny. I need to go back to uni. I need to make it work. I need to prove to these bastards that I deserve to be there. Um, And so, yeah, I kind of worked hard, saw saw what saw the life I didn't particularly want to lead lead. Um, And. um, got angry enough and political enough that when I went back I wasn't that kind of middling guy who you can just about get away with slinging out I was um I was the hothead that people wanted to see so um you know kind of it was it was interesting from that point of view so that that was that was my first job um and yeah kind of from there graduated as an architect um did a little bit of freelance work doing kind of 3d modeling which was something that I'd picked up um, another advantage of, of failing that second year was that I got to see most of my peers go out into the real world after a degree and not get any jobs because we weren't taught to use AutoCAD. We were taught to use charcoal and pens because it's a fine art from these old duffers at uni. Um, by the time I got into my final year, they introduced what they called an IT course. So I learned how to use a computer. I learned how to do AutoCAD and Photoshop and yeah, 3D modeling, and, and that, that really helped me kick off. So, you know, kind of when I graduated, did freelance for a little bit um, as a 3D modeler and then got a job at an architect's practice on the ridiculous salary of seven and a half grand plus, plus a computer because I didn't have one. Um, so they offered to give me a computer because they knew they were getting a good deal. And I, I found out later that they were actually boasting about having, having got the 3D modeler from um, Piers Goff's studio because I was doing some freelance work for them at the time and they were kind of better known um Mm -hmm. and yeah so I kind of worked as an architect for a couple of years I'd got into this weird internet thing that kind of when I was at uni so that was kind of mid 90s so you know probably built my first website 94 or 95 as part of my architecture studies um had it as a little bit of a side gig when I went back to do my diploma um having worked for a couple of years in practice and um finished my diploma with two people working full-time for me in a web design company and so that that's kind of the path that that I ended up kind of taking I kind of figured well if I'm going to try something different now's the time to do it I know I could get a job back at my own my old practice but actually kind of didn't want to I wanted to go somewhere big and sexy 
um, or I could give this a go. And that that kind of became my first marketing role, I guess, in a way. I mean, we started off as web design and then as as um, as digital became more known and more supported through the industry, you know, we kind of got more involved in kind of marketing campaigns and I got to work with some absolutely wonderful marketers. And at the time, it was so young that people didn't really understand the limitations of digital. It's not like now where we can kind of just say it's a channel. It was a technology that people didn't understand. So you had designers wanting to literally put a poster on the internet and that was it. Um, or fashion designers wanted to put full full screen videos. And this was back before real video. There was there was no video on the web back then. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of me as the architect kind of going, right, okay, we want it to look good, but we want it to work. And that kind of really helped me out there. And then, yeah, as I say, kind of picked up some clients and started doing more campaigns, launch campaigns for movies, for games, um, various fmcg clients and um got fascinated by the marketing side of it and sort of accidentally became a marketer with absolutely no training or, or really any knowledge yeah you're fitting well then <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> found my feet <laughs> yeah that's nice i i like that i can't decide if it's a if it's a small sidestep or whether it was quite a leap but i suppose because it happened quite naturally it probably didn't feel like that big a leap i don't know maybe i'm wrong no, I mean, it's, it, it didn't. And I think the other thing to say, uh, and kind of, you know, you know Tom, Tom Goodwin, I think, is a former alumni of yours, isn't he? He, he studied architecture. And um, one of the things that I genuinely believe about architecture is that above anything else, it, it trains you and, and guides you to be inquisitive. And, um, you know, I remember, you know, during degree and postgrad, we we were we had our hands over everything. Yeah, you know, everyone, everyone was trying fashion design, furniture design, animations, all sorts of stuff. We're just interested in everything, and you know, it's kind of it is the only discipline that is a classic fine art and a classic profession. Um, there's philosophy alongside it. There's a lot of depth to it, which I guess is why we take seven years to get there. Um, but for me, kind of. It was just it was just a natural path and it, it kind of started out actually kind of um i was doing i'd done a little bit of it as part of my final degree project i was but i was working on the, our brief was to do kind of an exhibition or an art gallery center and i was like well you know there's no reason let, let's let's be democratic with this so i came up with a concept that was based around trucks going up and down the country and very quick to put up frames and shipping containers who very funky and cool but also a website why not use this new interweb thing and um, have a website version and i just got really fascinated by it and um my first side gig was actually doing nightclub visual visuals so i had a couple of couple of guys that i used to kind of go down and set up the visuals the projections and stuff and um one of them got sponsored by a internet cafe when they used to be a thing and got given some some web space well like, yeah i'll have a go and, and that was literally my first website and it got picked up by Time Out. It was website of the week in there. Um, and whilst I was kind of doing my diploma, just too many people wanted me to come along and do what I did because I sort of understood the art and the science of it. So I think I think the architect really, really fit it, but also just that curiosity of being an architect. Yeah. I also like the way that there's a real uh, route of discovery when it comes to something new. There's a quote, you've alluded to it already, um, but we can elaborate on that maybe now or, or later when we talk, is that tactics are not strategy, but tactics are not dumb. And I mm. do think there is this kind of arrogance in the strategy sphere in making what is absolutely the correct statement of the significance of strategy that has been overlooked, as it doesn't mean that tactics are dumb. And actually, whether it's a new technology or new media, whatever it might be, in, in, in this instance, it was the internet. So yes, it was very significant. But that step of curiosity that led you into it, then evolved and evolved and evolved. And it, it probably built up momentum to a point where all of a sudden you're working in this kind of what you would call a marketing space. But it was only because you were curious and discovered this new thing. Um, and then people were more and more reliant on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that kind of that followed me along my career. I mean, you know, the, the first agency, say, we started out as web design and we ended up becoming, well, actually, we, we, we ended up doing quite a lot of marketing, broader marketing, as well as just digital, um, but certainly kind of digital marketing specialists. And and then kind of from there, sort of my, my interest in new technology 
and you know I'm, I'm not one of these um it's shiny we must do it but i i have always been one of these here's something new sounds like it might be interesting i will have a look at it myself i'm, I'm uh, yeah and if i see something in there that might have value to our business or our clients then we'll see what that is but you know i'm not going to foist it on them and so quite early i realized that there were a lot of opportunities to do some cool stuff on social media you know, particularly with the movie campaigns that, that we were doing at the time. So, you know, that, that this is going back even to the days of MySpace. So, you know, we, we were able to set up, um, I mean, one of the campaigns we worked on, one of my favorite ever, and it was the 25th anniversary DVD release of With Nell and I. And, um, yeah, we, we set up a really cool sort of animated flash drinking game that was quite sweet. Uh, we had some kind of seeding campaigns going on, but we also set up a, a With Nell and an I uh, profile on, on on MySpace, which didn't really do much, but at that time it kind of fit quite, fitted quite nicely into that world, and it was a lot of fun for us, yeah. and it was a lot of fun for the people that got it because it's the kind of movie where you, you you kind of have to get it to like it anyway, so you know you play along with it. It worked out really nicely, so I've I've, I've always done that, and even even now, you know, most most new platforms or or channels that come out, there's a Johnny Ego on there because I'm having a look at it, mm. and I've continued to so. Yeah, it's. I, I think I think that, but it's it's kind of looking at. Um, well, do we go into strategy and tactics now? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a nice okay. caveat though. Before before you go in too deep, it's a really nice caveat because I remember talking to is a good friend of Weimar Schneider, and I think JP, funnily enough, introduced us a guy called Frederick Halberg, mm. and he is wonderful. I believe he still works with Weimar, but if that's wrong, I'm going to edit that straight out. Um, <laughs> and it, you would love his presentations because he has this real. He he structures all of his presentations. Um, in the theme of a particular 80s film, uh, 80s oh, art classic man. often, which is wonderful anyway. But the point I'm trying to make here is he said to me on the show that, yes, uh, it, it very much agreed with you, but he said, yes, but the shiny new things are also fun. And that's like the caveat that I think everyone needs to feel comfortable with, like allowing yeah. yourself to explore, whether it's, I don't know, crypto, NFT, whatever it might be. Yeah. There is something alluring about something new. And before we dismiss it, and we might be right to dismiss it, we might be wrong, it doesn't matter at that stage. Having a little look and a play is really important. 100%. So let's do strategy and tactics. Well, how to put... So, I mean... <sighs> let's start with your... Because you've got a, dig, a very much digital marketing background. So you yes. must come into contact over that time with a lot of what, you know, Ritson would call tactification and wrestling with those shiny new things. So where is that in oh, between that and strategy? So, I mean, for, for me, and particularly in the early days of digital, um, you, know, you, you, you wouldn't get given a strategy. And so actually quite often I'd have to go away and sort of hack, hack out my own completely untrained strategy. Um, because, it, you know, the thing with tactics is they still need to deliver to some kind of strategy. And you can have strategic tactics. It doesn't mean their strategy. So, you know, you can you can have strategic digital. That doesn't mean it's a digital strategy, if that makes sense. And for me, I kind of found that early days, me being told that I was a tactician and not strategic, I, I was probably pretty pissed off with it because I kind of thought, well, yeah, I'm doing some smart stuff here. What are you talking about? But I think part of the problem is that, you know, there, there, there isn't a there isn't a connection there isn't a connection across the industry and I see it even more now. So, you know, I've, I've, I've gone from various kinds of tacticians to, to, to strategic over the last few years and I see it slightly differently now, but I still think that there's a lot of clever stuff that's done within the tactical space that isn't necessarily lesser than the strategies. And it's not just delivering to the strategy. It's not dumb pressing of buttons, which is sometimes how it's presented. You've got to take the strategy and go, okay, I know what I'm doing in my channel, whether or not it's digital or promotions or loyalty or whatever. I know what I'm doing in here. Let's come up with something that delivers to the strategy. And sometimes, you know, particularly if you're, you're at the, the bottom of the chain, which certainly digital has been for a long time or certainly was back in the day, as I said, you weren't given strategies. So, so you'd sort of try to eke what you could and then, and then sort of work up a smart way of doing it. So I think there's a lot of... There's a lot of talent and a lot of intellect that goes into tactics, but it's not a strategy. And I think we, we maybe need to stop, particularly for younger people in, coming into the industry, or and, and I, I think probably more so for agency than, than, than client side. You know, the, 
we need to stop saying that strategy is greater than tactics. I think we need to say, yes, it's first and it, and, and it is, you know, it, it has to be done properly. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's less forgiving in some ways, but it doesn't mean that a strategist is automatically better than a tactician. Mm. And um, there was a, I think I was listening to Uncensored CMO podcast. I'm sorry to speak about the competition, uh, but I was, I was listening to that recently and um, they had someone on from one of the magazines and he was basically saying, you know, no, 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 nobody, you have to be a, str a strategist. You, you have to be strategic in order to be remembered in the industry. And I just thought that was so disrespectful. You know, I, I, until probably three, four years ago, I was purely tactical and my, yeah. my expertise in promotional marketing and loyalty, I, I'd, I'd kind of argue is second to very few. And, you know, I've done, I've come up with some great campaigns. I've been really proud of them. They've, del they've delivered. You know, they, they've delivered to, to strategies, they've delivered to KPIs that aren't vanity KPIs. I've never believed in that bullshit. Yeah. But that doesn't make me lesser than, let's say, a middle of the road strategist. And I, and I think there's sort of that disconnect in the industry at the moment where, you know, you're getting a pushback from the tacticians. It's saying, no, it's this, it's that. And you've got people who normally seem to have blue backgrounds on their fucking profile pictures, just <laughs> spreading absolute bullshit lies and feeding the people that don't actually realize the difference between strategy and tactics and don't realize that it's not that one's greater or other but they're different you know and um i i, I yeah i i get annoyed because i mean we, we we see people that we know and respect senior people kind of really going to town on on youngsters who are just making mistakes sometimes so for me i'm never going to pile on to someone relatively new from a tactical background I will absolutely pile on to someone who is exploiting their lack of knowledge and their lack of experience for their own gains. So, you know, blue guy, I'll go after him every week. But yeah, we, we, when you get people just kind of... I saw you go after one last week, actually. I'm quite right. Yeah, it was him. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it was, it was just absolute nonsense. And again, it's, it's deliberately misrepresenting tactics of strategy. They're different things. Yeah. And actually a lot of the fun is in the tactics a lot of the creativity is in yeah. the tactics that the you know I mean, we, we've both done the the mini mini mba we're both very familiar with the mark ritson approach and it's it's planning you know it, it's planning it's not the sexy stuff and yeah it does require a lot of thought and i'm really glad i've done it and i'm really glad where i am now and where i've been the last few years of my career but the fun was going away and just coming up with madcap ideas you know yeah yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. I think I think in many instances, you've got two groups of people who are both right in their intentions and often just trying to argue about who's more important because everyone needs that feedback and that that kind of uh, feeling of, of being important. Yes, um, absolutely. But sadly, the, the things that trip them up are either the big egos that do use vanity metrics and might have hundreds of thousands of followers and blue ticks just spouting absolute nonsense. And as soon as you make that person your cult hero, to pin all your arguments against, then there's a problem. I do yeah. remember, I'm sure I've said this numerous times on the pod, but not for a long time. So I'm going to wheel it out again. But, I, but there's um, a lovely story about uh, Bill Birnbach and he used to carry around in his blazer a card that simply said, they might be right. And he would take it out and read it every time he found himself in, in an argument a bit like the one we're discussing that can <laughs> happen now and then. The reason behind it was so it would literally... Allow, like reset his brain and allow him to have a conversation even though going into the discussion he was quite comfortable that this person was wrong it would at yeah. least allow them to have a conversation and i think sadly nowadays probably in part to blame with the, the formats we use to talk about things where things are almost forced into being yes or no like or don't like on social media and twitter and, and whatever you're almost pressured into making a, a very binary decision about yes i'm on their side or no i'm on there as opposed to like the reality, which is it's a bit of a grey area, and there's yeah. valid arguments on both sides. Uh, but let's just have a rock anyway. I I absolutely believe that almost everything in every field and every area of life is somewhere in the, the shades of grey. You know, not, not very few things are black and white. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've got a six year old son, and um, it's it's something I'm trying to teach him because you know the the apparent greatest leader that this country has ever had is also a white supremacist. How, how, how do you bang those two things together? So it's, it's kind of, you know, say no, nothing is black or white. 
would 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 we have um, would we have come out victorious the war if it wasn't for Winston Churchill? Maybe not. Probably not. Was he a white supremacist? Yes, he absolutely was. Those two things can live together and and quite often do. Yeah. And you know, it's the same with the same with marketing arguments. So, sometimes pe- people are right. And one of the things that that does bug me is when you know, is, is when we end up going deep diving into a rabbit hole of shit based purely on terminology. And it's mm. like, yeah, come on, give up now. I mean, the, the whole argument around what content is, I just don't see the need for that one. And I, and I kind of get it. You know, this has always been around and it's always been around and now it's called content. Yeah, because mm. now it's a load, a load of things have been thrown under one thing. You can't just call it PR. You can't just call it journalism. You probably can't just call it copywriting. So they're calling it content. I understand what content marketing is. It doesn't upset me, but mm. it does seem to upset some people. Yeah. No, very well said. But you're right, we need a bit more tolerance and we need to not assume that everybody is uh, completely or absolutely one thing or another. I mean, I took the girls over Christmas to see Disney on ice, um, but it doesn't mean I agree with Walt Disney's far right views. It's not what I heard, Giles. Yeah, I mean, I I do, but it doesn't mean that I do because (laughs) of... (laughs) Gotcha, gotcha, yeah, Yeah, yeah. gotcha. But I mean, I I think that's a really nice, that's a really nice kind of um, quote. And one of the things that, probably one of the proudest moments of my career was when I, I, I was kind of a judge at the Institute of Promotional Marketing Awards a few times. And um, yeah, you, you do the first round remote and you kind of come up your marks and then you go in and you do a panel and you sit in together. And um, we've gone into the panel. And there's two or three kind of strong voices and maybe I was one of them, I don't know. But, you know, I, I, I had my thoughts on stuff and I was quite happy to talk about them, but I was quite happy to listen. And I ended up changing my mind on so many so right. many of the campaigns and, and where they sat um and i was i was quite happy with that you know i, I got, went in with an open mind I, I listened i was happy to adjust uh one, one, one of the other one of the other um judges who i got to know really well afterwards yeah he, he said john you know what congratulations mate you're the most wrong person i've ever met and he meant it he meant it as a as a, as, a, as you know he, he meant it he meant it well and i took it well and uh, he ended up he ended up becoming kind of key to um, my agency at the time because we ended up doing a lot of work with his agency. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of being wrong sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw someone, um, I don't know who it was actually, I don't want to uh, just guess and get it wrong, but someone was, was, was talking on Twitter fairly recently about how we really need to normalise the response of, I don't really know enough about that topic to have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I feel yeah, like we I saw that. That was brilliant. Uh, we've not uh, on call to action. We've never really had a promotions slant or wonk um, in terms of our, our guests. <laughs> but of course, you, you you have a lot of experience in, in promotions, and obviously that is uh, a nod to your current role as as, as well as, as your past. What are the, some of the misconceptions that people have about promotion? But of course, promotions don't need to mean discounting. No, ab- absolutely not. And um, yeah, to be honest, discount promotions. You don't need a promotions agency. So um, I've, I've not really worked on discount promotions. Um, what I've worked on is kind of prize promotions or, or quite often brand promotions. So, you know, for, for, for me as a promotional marketer, um, let's not devalue the product. Uh, let's, not, let's not reward the activity with the product because you want people to buy it and you want people to buy it at full price. So it's really about how you can, how, how you can sort of tap into the, the the right kind of consumer who you want to buy the brand with something that's related to the brand so more often than not it's, it's about kind of sometimes it's about channels sometimes it's about mechanics um quite often it's about pricing and certainly my the, the last agency i was at kind of agency side ndl group they they they've built a 25 year kind of legacy of of prize and winner management and you know that that makes all the difference so you know if you can get people engaged with a product and a brand without just taking money off. And there's whole, whole different ways you can do that. And you know, it, it does quite often come down to what are you asking them to do? How high is the bar to entry? And what are you going to reward them with? And how relevant is that to your product or brand? And once you've got those things as bases, then you can do an awful lot. And promotions on that perspective aren't necessarily just the, the kind of short ROI they can be brand promotions. So, you know, kind of, I guess a few examples um, from my more recent history. So kind of did a little work with 
a wonderful client, absolutely wonderful client. Really, really, really enjoyed working with Rosa um, at uh, Sofidel. So that they have a number of paper towel and home home towel paper type products. And Regina Blitz is one of theirs. And um, for the last two or three years now, we've been running a Christmas campaign, which is design the Christmas packaging. And you know, we, we get we get punters to send in designs and one of them gets printed on the Christmas pack. We have a public vote, although we we filled it first because we don't have Boaty McBoatface. So we judge it, we pick a final five, we put that to a public vote. It then becomes what you see down the aisles at Christmas and the person that's submitted it and that's won it, not only do they see their design, they get the most perfect VIP white glove treatment Christmas at home. We, we, we get the tree, we help them with a gift list, um, decorate the house, clean the house, all of those things. And so, you know, none of that was about discounting. It was all about kind of brand visibility and, mm. and kind of creating seasonal occasions for that brand because they're not going to have the budget to have a, you know, have a carrot or, or a Percy pig or a ver- various animals and, or things up in space. But it was something that we were able to do that spoke quite well to their audience and was only going to appeal to their audience. So, you know, th- yeah, those kind of things can can work. So, you know, you can do these things long and short. And it's it's not like the long and the brand activation is is only loyalty. You can do it with promotions. And it's just about kind of how you deliver them. And again, it's what what okay, client, what what are you looking to achieve out of this? What is your strategy? And if you're looking at a 12-month um, promotional plan, then let's look at what we want to achieve at different points. Is it activation? Is it retention? Is it amplification? Is it just a brand experience? All of those things can run through promotions because all a promotion is really is you do something for us and there's a chance that you'll get something back from us. Mm. You use the word loyalty there. There's a, there's a nice quote <laughs> of yours. Everybody is both right and wrong about it. Um, what do you mean about that? Because I think it's fair to say that some people hear the word loyalty and kind of recoil. Yeah. Um, but I suppose like many things, the answer is it depends. Yeah, no, totally. It does depend. And I, I think one of the things with loyalty is we all use the word, but none of us mean the same thing. So when we talk about um, you know, kind of Byron Sharp loyalty, it's it's about repeat purchase. It's about repeat purchase. Am I purchasing? Um, when we talk about loyalty programs, Actually, they're much more about the the brand effect than the the immediate purchase. So they're they're much more based on the long than the short. Um, but also they're, they're they're more than that. So you know, there are a whole lot of different reasons you might run a loyalty program. And obviously, we know this from Tesco. Yeah, get, getting insight into your consumers is huge, and it can completely change a business. Um, so, you know, you've got insight with your consumers, you've got an opportunity to market to them on a more regular basis. And we know that not all of them are going to be relevant. You know, a few percent are going to be ready to buy at any time, but you've now got a reason for speaking to them regularly. Um, and you know, it, 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 does, it does a lot more than just drive the next sale. Of course, it needs to drive sales. But as we know from, from you know, Binet and Field, sales aren't all about the immediate. And loyalty programs can help with that. And I've worked on loyalty in the past agency side. And obviously my role now is in-house, uh, client side doing loyalty. And I can tell you, it, it starts with very hard numbers. It's all based yeah. on hard numbers. All of the planning, all of the mapping, all of the rewards are based on you know, g- generating a, a, an operating profit for the program, but also for the business. And so when you look at loyalty being... Sometimes it seems to be seen as, um, yeah, if this this person only buys Diet Coke, I'm a loyalist Diet Coke. That, we know that doesn't exist. I mean, yeah, we, we, even people that thought maybe in the past, we've had that proved that doesn't exist. You know, what we have is is basically, a, you know, from, from a category, we, we have a number of regulars that we will pick from, and one of them might be the favorite. But if you're thirsty and Diet Coke isn't there, you're not going to die of thirst. So, yeah dismiss that immediately that's nonsense a lot of so-called loyalty is is just yeah just kind of inertia and we know that as well so that even even within loyalty programs we know that there's massive degrees between what the consumers do how much they're likely to engage and we know that we've got that top one percent maybe that is kind of a real fan of the brand and it does happen maybe not with all brands i can mm. think of let's say at least one out of denmark that it does genuinely happen 
Um, yeah. And there are reasons why, uh, you know, kind of, but also you've got a whole load of people that aren't going to do anything ever. And um, yeah, it was one, one of the, one of the best things I, I think I ever read was, and it was in, it was, it was Vima and uh, Charles Graham in, in Eat Your Greens. And um, it was about the lightness of buying and, you know, the, something like 60 percent of, of buyers in any category for any brand only buy once within kind of one to five years mm. and that's that's a stunning thing to know and for for a lot of people particularly loyal your people in loyalty they see that as a as a challenge i don't i see that as a recognition of reality and really it's okay well those people are going to keep cycling in those people are going to keep cycling in. So acquisition is super important for a loyalty program as well as for, for, for just sales. Um, but we can build a lot more on it, but we're not expecting it to be an overnight success. No, no loyalty programs an overnight success. And back in my agency days, we'd pitch it and it'd be, you know, you're not going to break even for 18 months. That's not how these things work. But once we build up ahead of steam and work into the numbers, we can do. So I think loyalty is mm. misunderstood. Um, it was quite amusing when I when I kind of um, posted my my new role update on LinkedIn. Kind of, um, I think it was Shan Biglione who kind of replied, "Loyalty job," <laughs> and it was, I, I think that's kind of um, how it's often seen as in the industry. Uh, yeah, yeah, fair play. I, I had a bit of a laugh, but I, I think also there's there's a misunderstanding um, of of Byron Sharp's position on loyalty. Yeah, I, I I saw him. I actually saw him present with Charles Graham this this chapter. It was the first chapter in Eat Your Greens, um, and it you know he, he said there there is no loyalty without reason because there's no reason. That was his quote, and he's right. There is no loyalty without reason because there's no reason. Doesn't mean there's no loyalty. Also, doesn't necessarily mean that loyalty is the best way to growth. So, you know, we, we've had again this year, 2022 is the year of retention being the new the, the new acquisition. Bollocks. It's not, you know, let, let's not get caught up in that crap. It's the same people with blue backgrounds spouting bullshit. But the, the, there, is a, there is a place for it. And if you're the right kind of brand in the right kind of category, but more importantly, you've got the resources, you can play in every area. And I think that's that to me is the important thing, both in terms of what Byron Sharp says, but also, you know, Mark Ritson, you, you, you play where you can play. You play for you play where you can get success. You're very smart, John. <laughs> I think uh... no, I, just, I, I just go on rants every now and again. <laughs> but I think I think what you've just said about loyalty is really, really important to not understand it as something that's necessarily going to drive repeat purchase. And it's that kind of passive, maybe or at least passively thought of an indirect benefit of customer data. I think when you have the objective of repeat purchase, I've never seen someone dismiss it as you would expect with such brutal force as Bob Hoffman, <laughs> who... Um, I, he's written a blog about going to his local coffee shop where you can collect stamps for a free coffee. Yeah. And uh, when they offered him one of these cards that after six stamps, he gets a free coffee. I think his retort was, if I wanted a free coffee, I'd stay at home. Yeah. Um, but of course, you're, you're absolutely right. The data that you get from those types of programs can then lead to really, really effective, um, proper marketing. So that's really smart. Have you ever heard the story about uh, Target? in the States, you were one of the very first to roll out a, a national loyalty program. Um, I don't know if I heard the story, but certainly one of the campaigns I worked on several years ago, we, we, we partnered up with Target. Oh, okay. Well, um, well, you might know a bit more about this. I don't know, but there is a, when they first started, that they were using the data from the cards, um, which I suppose is true to the point you've just been making. They were using the data from the cards to dictate the promotional leaflets that would then go to that household. So based mm -hmm. on their shopping behavior, they would recommend deals on certain products, et cetera, et cetera. So all very logical and smart. But they had started to notice that there was a, um, a young lady whose shopping behavior had basically triggered their system into believing, and it turns out accurately, that this young lady was pregnant. Um, and so the promotional leaflets, the door drops that would then go to this property where she lived with her mum and dad, then started to promote, you know, products appropriate to her kind of, you know, pre, um, 
<laughs> uh, kind of maternity type products. And the father, uh, as I say the story goes, I'm sure it's one of Rory's, so I'm, I'm, I believe in the, the background that's certainly not made up, then went into one of the local stores to complain about it and then subsequently discovered that the, the store actually knew more than he did. Yeah. Um, so what they started to do, they, they started to intentionally place the products that they believed to be mo- more relevant or most appropriate to that user based on their buying behavior. They would, they would place it further down the leaflet so it wasn't like the lead hero promo. Nice. Also because people like to kind of feel like they've discovered the thing that is a great deal for them rather than be force fed it. So there's a couple of yeah. um, parts to that, which I've always really, really liked. Brilliant. Oh, it sounds very Rory. Yeah, it does. It does yeah. sound very Rory. And I, 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 I am familiar with it, whether or not I've heard him in a talk or, or read it. I, I, I didn't remember that as being target, but yeah, it's, 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 I mean, that's the thing, you know, the, the behavior patterns that you can see when you, when you've got a mature and voluminous loyalty program, are just amazing absolutely stunning i mean yeah, yeah. i i, I I'm, i've always been one for getting my my nerd on and by that i don't necessarily mean digital nerd i mean my kind of you know performance nerd stats how things are doing kind of data and, and financial analysis but I, I i love sitting on a dashboard and um yeah kind of working out what's going on where it's going on and who's doing what and the, the just the volume of data you get from these programs is stunning absolutely brilliant mm-hmm. and yeah obviously a, a company like lego we, we've got you know huge teams that are pulling this together and managing it, and you know we, we, we've got dedicated business intelligence people for, for for the VIP program, and it's 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 mind blowing. I mean, I've 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 learned a lot of new things. I've learned a lot of new things by just looking into that data, and you know you, you learn about completely different people. So I mean, I, I was speaking to someone to someone recently about um, something a previous agency did for, for Hasbro. And it was a, it was a nerf loyalty program in, in the U S um, and they kind of said, well, yeah, I, I guess it's a completely different market from Lego, isn't it? It's going to be kind of um, frat boys and teenage kids. And no, it's not actually, you know, one, one of the things that we found, one, one of the highest purchases was, a, and the person that most often tried to scam the program was a 52 year old lawyer. So, you know, you, you, you learn about, you learn about purchase patterns and, and where they purchase and how they purchase and what they purchase and who they are. And it completely changes your, your view. It completely changes your view. I mean, if, if you were to think maybe 10, 15 years ago, you know, Le- Lego's a, it's a kid's toy, right? Lego sets are for kids. Lego bricks are for kids. Look at the data. Look at Jerry Dakin, as you mentioned earlier. <laughs> I was um, going to say, it's for kids and Jerry. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? Jerry was the first person that actually visited me in my flat in Loughton because um, he, he he helped me out with some research when I was interviewing for the role. So I said, right, I'm going to buy you a set. So uh, he, he came to pick up his set from here. <laughs> and it's, it's actually, funnily enough, the first time I met him. I spoke to him loads of times, but, you know, obviously we've not all got to get to meet the people that we chat to all the time. Um, yeah. Not just over Twitter, but, but with, with kind of the pandemic. So, you know. Uh, it, it was funny that the first person coming around here was to pick up his Lego. And of course it was Jerry. And um, actually when I, when I first had a one-to-one with the head of our business intelligent unit at Lego, she had been at Diageo in the past and, and at the same uh, time as Jerry. Jerry. And I, it, yeah. She, and we both literally said at the same time, Jerry's a huge fan of Lego. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Never a truer word said. Absolutely. Eno- enough, Love Jerry, that. now. Enough. Let's talk other things. There's other people. You're right. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's almost, um, it's almost uh, you, would, you would think if you saw the amount of data that people can or brands at that volume of scale that you're um, talking about can get on, on customers and individual consumers, it almost feels like it should have been really, really intrusive. But of course, everyone quite freely gives up this information. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, th- now we're moving into a world of, um, you know, second party data being scrapped and stuff like that. They're, they're talking about what they're calling zero party data. I don't know about the terminology, mm. but, yeah, if you've got people that are actively engaging in, in a brand program that is aligned to their purchasing, then you, you have that data. You, you're not having to second guess. And, and a lot of the stuff that I did in the promotional world was about, you know, finding out. It was about getting data. So, yeah, I started off in digital and then my second agency was it was it was digital promotions and there were no digital promotions agencies at the time so it was a bloody hard sell into the market you know we, we had a us hq that had been running for a few years before they acquired my first agency and we kind of launched it here in europe 
Um, and it took a few years to educate and find our position. And our position here wasn't the same as it was in the US. Um, you know, at the time, they just understood, yeah, this is a promotion. This is our promotion budget. Here, people wanted to run campaigns, you know, cool campaigns, sexy campaigns, viral campaigns. And all of those things kind of can and often do come under the heading of a promotion. But with the digital version, we were able to get data. We were able to get more information. And particularly when you were kind of tying into... Uh, yeah, I'm no Cambridge Analytica fan, but when you were tying into um, social media, we're not looking on an individual level, but people who had engaged with, let's say, a promotional app, you're able to see broadly across the group what other interests they have, other kind of um, behaviors that you didn't have access to before. And particularly if it's kind of, you know, a, 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 a cash-based um, purchase model. So, I mean, obviously there's lots of great research out there, but this is this is seeing people doing it in real time. And I think particularly for smaller brands and smaller companies, it's it's a much easier way of, of starting intelligently. And I, I, I've been a big advocate for years of Facebook's ad program, not necessarily running ads, but I'll tell you what, it's a bloody good research tool. Really good research tool yeah. because it's got so much data on what is a fair representation of the world particularly if you're talking digital activation, let's be honest, but there's enough people on there that you've got a fair kind of view of the world from doing it. And it's something that I did for many years because, you know, being a non-traditional marketer, I, I didn't know the right way of doing many things. But interestingly, I kind of, um, I mentioned it to, to Mark Ritson when I was doing the mini MBA and um, he kind of replied going, yeah, it's a smart move. That's, that's definitely a good way of doing it. So I was like, yep, yeah, validated, validated by the big guy. He came out in a rash while saying it, but validated <laughs> indeed. Well, I think it's all about being informed, isn't it? It's making sure you're informed and loyalty certainly gives you that as yeah. does um, Facebook to ex an extent, unless you're counting teenagers in Sweden, in which case it's going to vastly inflate that population. Indeed. I've got a couple of listener questions for you, John. Okay. So asking the general public for their opinion, be it on Brexit or boat names, is notoriously fraught with danger. But Alex from Lincoln asks, can you think of any ways your background in architecture has influenced your approach as a marketer? Oh, yeah. So you loosely mentioned um, that kind of move from architecture into marketing at the beginning of the show. But is there yeah. anything else that you think has... Uh, has uh, been 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 relevant no absolutely i mean the, the thing about the thing about architecture um is you're creating you're usually creating spaces for human beings to do stuff in so you know you, you've got that whole kind of consumer understanding or inhabitant understanding so you're, you're starting with that you're starting with the, the human you're starting with the person which you know market orientation you're starting with the person what they do what they like to do what they don't like to do and you know much of marketing is for me is about kind of um either reinforcing or changing what consumers do yeah we, we either want to reinforce the product that they normally buy or we want to give them a reason to buy a different product and likewise much of architecture is about reinforcing how people are using spaces or improving it or you know kind of upgrading it and a lot of it kind of comes back to yeah you know, i've talked about routine and ritual on on um isolated talks but a lot of it comes back to those routines and rituals that we have as humans whether or not it's just a human in a space or a human in a in a supermarket so for me starting with that understanding has been massive has been massive influence on on what i've done as a marketer but also kind of the, the whole the curiosity thing and the fact that you, you're kind of, I don't know, I, I guess I kind of quite early on started buying into some of the kind of, um, some of the great architects of the past, like um, Archigram, where they were treating certain architectural things as products. And I, I, I used to play with that at uni. So, you know, I remember we, we, we had to do something, we had to build a small thing. And so um, I came up with a yeah, stupid idea obviously but a body length umbrella that sits on a hat and i had to build this thing i'm like well if i'm building it i'm going to give it a name it's the umbrella asylum i'm going to come up with it so I, I ended up presenting a pretty shit kind of um, viz style ad for this thing at my crit as well as as well as building it and um yeah even when i went to postgrad i, I remember this is basically, I invented the metaverse, right? So um, when I was at postgrad, I got really fascinated by the concept of augmented reality. Um, but it's clumsy, it's clunky. You know, the, 
yeah. we we do. I mean, I I never foresaw I never foresaw smartphones. I I, I never ever saw us touching a screen because to me that would be too grubby. But it's worked. But anyway, mm. so you know, being able to kind of see what you want to see while you're on the move without having to sit there with a device really appealed to me. But so at the time, I kind of explored this idea of of a kind of biotech um, implant into the eye. I can't remember what I called it, but again, I called it something and I had a whole kind of campaign behind it. And you, you kind of, one of the things you're almost trained to do as an architect is you, you're almost trained to outgrow your job. Um, and I, I, I both enjoy that and I don't enjoy it. And let me explain what I bloody mean by that first. But I found at uni and I went back and I, as a tutor, actually, and I found that there were very gifted students who would be very good jobbing architects. You know, they're never going to, be the most creative people in the world but architecture needs jobbing architects it needs people that can do a job and get respect from the planners and the structural engineers not just arty farty types right they were all they're all directed out of the course everyone was basically geared up to starting your own practice even in even in degree and most most of my close architect friends have at some point or another either gone it alone or set up a, a practice so the process of doing that it's you're thinking about the business you're thinking about business models already so i, I think that there's a there's a lot in that that kind of uniquely comes from architecture yeah great answer number number two is probably an easier answer actually um uh, it's from laura in london and she says where is hat off next in the <laughs> hashtag adventures of hat <laughs> created a monster i really have yeah i mean bloody hell um yeah the, Fucking hat. So, you, you, do you know how that started? Do you even remember how that started? I don't. No, I don't. I don't. Oh, yeah. So, I've always loved a hat. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Back back in my completely pretentious Shoreditch DJ days, I, I I was the guy in the trilby, and um, yeah, the, the clubs and bars that I'd play at would they, they'd kind of have me down as either John the Hat or John the Hat. So I've always been a hat lover. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm a lot more practical and a lot less poncy these days. So. I had a baseball cap that I'd kind of wear if it looked like it was going to rain or be too sunny uh, because as a glasses wearer, having to take off my glasses and put on prescription sunglasses is a pain in the backside and you've got to carry them around. So, you know, cap's quite useful, um, but I unfortunately spilled a pint over my cap whilst sat in a pub um, doing my homework for the mini MBA. So I bought a cap online and uh, it got here and I was just like, it's a bit boxy. It looks a bit poncy. I don't know that. I don't know that it suits me and as, as I kind of clearly forgot about it and then got drunk through through the process of the evening I think I just kind of tweaked you know I'm not sure if I can wear this what do you think and uh, yeah you've got it you've got it you've got it so I got all this kind of feedback on it and then it's just thought okay well I'll play the joke one more time and um, yeah so I, I wore it and I kind of wore it out and took a picture of, of me out wearing this hat and hashtagged it adventures of hat and um suddenly I realized my hat was more popular than me. It, it clearly, you know, pe people that I genuinely <laughs> thought were, were kind of personal friends were more interested in what was going on with the fucking hat than, than me. Um, so yeah, I've kind of kept that up a little bit. And the funny thing was I'd never worn the hat at the office at, at, at Lego group. Um, but they've got this thing called the minifigure factory, which is really cool in some of the big stores mm. where you can basically go and design and customize your own minifigure and you can even kind of draw the, the, the shirt and stuff. And so I did one of me, but it didn't have my hat, but I found somewhere online because someone actually someone on Twitter went, oh, you can get it from here. Um, Cause I've now got getting followed by lots of, um, lots of Lego fans or adult fans of Lego, AFOLs as, as we call them and they call themselves. And so th this guy kind of got in touch and um, told me where to get it. And I got it and I sh showed my colleagues in the office and they're like, but you never wear a hat, John. I was like, Jesus, man, you guys are not on Twitter, are you? So. <laughs> So I don't know where hat is going next because I, I don't know um, I don't know how I don't know how possible it is to go places at the moment. But you know I've I've taken him into the office. I've taken him into um, Leicester Square. I've taken him out for a drink a couple of times. He's he's taken the kids to school. He's met the bins. Um, <laughs> there will be more adventures of hat. Uh, I, I think Amazing. possibly even with my little minifigure me. I, 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 do you know what? I think that's probably the next one. Mini minifigure me in in a, in a in a big old Lego set. 
Perfect. Yeah, that's that, that's what needs to happen. Jerry needs that in his <laughs> in his collection. Uh, so the, uh, the the final part then, John, of the interview is our four pertinent poses. Uh, starting with, what advice would you give to your younger self? Okay, so I'm going to start with a caveat that I'm really happy where I am, and I, I would have wanted to end up here anyway. However, uh, my advice to my younger self would be always keep 51% a minimum. Don't set up a business and give away a percent more because I've a couple of times had it where it's bitten me in the ass. And um, right. really, if if, so, if someone's that keen and they believe in it that much, uh, coming into something that you started pretty much, then if they're holding out for that 1%, then there's, there's a problem with them. That is really interesting advice that we've not had before. Nice one. Um, number two, if you could banish one thing from the industry, what would it be and why? I bet you've wrestled with this one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I could banish one thing, Christ, what was it I came up with? Um, I mean, f f firstly, I, I tell you, I tell you what, I'd banish. I, I'd, I'd banish you slagging off Pokemon, mate. <laughs> and I know I'm not the first person to say this, but not, I've been playing no. Pokemon. Yeah. And I play it every day, and um, I've been playing it for six years now. Uh, five years, actually. Five years. Uh, no, what, what I would banish from the industry is people with large platforms misleading younger people in the industry. And, you know, I've, I'm not going to say just Gary Vee, because I know that's been, a, that's been done before, but it's also obvious, and he's not the only one. But those yeah. people who are exploiting their platforms to their own benefit and misleading people, um, yeah. I'd banish them in a heartbeat. I like the way you've done that. You've, you've kind of managed to grab quite a few in that one thing. It's very smart. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like I was Thank watching you. that. Um, who's it? There's a there's a notorious um, American preacher who's who's got a private jet and you know he's he's always trying to elicit donations from people um, and makes them feel guilty if they don't give him you know insane amounts of money to fund his you know ridiculous lifestyle. Um, and it's one of the most warped, horrific things. Every time I see it or see the guy's face, I, I just, I just, it, I find it hugely troubling. And I don't think there's actually, I think there's a surprising amount of parallels between him and maybe on a lesser scale, some of the people who seem to use their platform for their own personal gain. But um, let's try not to. Hundred percent. Is, is that the guy with a vacuum packed face? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a great. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. It. Yeah. I don't have a problem with Pokemon Go, by the way. I don't. I have a problem with people using it as the answer to the question. But anyway, I've done that. I've done that with David Granger's episode. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, you know that. I, okay. still, I, still, I still need to bring it up, mate. <laughs> oh, you legend. Right, okay, uh, two more. So any books that you can recommend to our listeners? Yeah. Um, at, well, I was going to say a couple. One is actually a trilogy, um, and another one is a marketing book. So... For me, I mean, obviously, the book that everyone needs to read, which we know, is the Little Red Book. But for me, probably the broadest and most interesting and exciting marketing book is 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 Vemas. Um, it's Eat Your Greens. Yeah, just just the range of brilliant marketing brains that are in that book. Uh, kind of everyone from Byron Sharp to 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 to, to your mate Ryan. Yeah, it just covers everything. And I, so I think Eat Your Greens is a, is a is a must buy for marketing. Um, one that just I really enjoyed at the time. So I've always been a big fan of Neil Stevenson. You know, he kind of started out as a bit of a cyber cyberpunk author, um, Snow Crash and stuff like that. But he wrote a trilogy called The Baroque Cycle. And uh, before that, he had something called Cryptonomicon, where he'd started to get into the concept of language and the differences in language and hieroglyphs and kind of almost kind of code breaking and language. It was really fascinating. And then, then he kind of wrote this Baroque cycle that was kind of a historical fiction um, that's just so rich and so in depth and so clever that, you know, for me, I, I, they're big old books, but I, I'd recommend the, the Baroque cycle by Neil Stevenson and um, Eat Greens by Fima Schneider. Nice. Amazing. So 50% of those haven't come up before. That sounds great. Uh, and the number four, John, is we always dedicate every episode to someone and we bestow or hospital pass that honour, depending on your view, to our guest. So would you kindly do the honours? Can I make a couple of honourable mentions first? Yes, you can. So a couple of people that I would have mentioned had they not already been. Um, you would certainly be one of them, um, not just for 
what you're doing here, you know, kind of isolated talks. I, I love the work that you do with Gasp Agency and um, you've just been an absolutely top bloke and uh, I feel like a better marketer through having got to know you. Um, the other one saved my life and that's Jem Higgins. Um, you know, wonderful person, obviously, you know her, I've worked with her and um, she's been on the show before. Love Jem to bits. Um, but I'm going to go for a new one. I'm going to go for the first client that as a digital marketer, took me under a wing and got me involved with marketing. And that is Debbie Rowland. Um, worked with her eventually several different places. And, and the last time I worked with her actually was she, so she was in entertainment. She's worked for Disney Entertainment One, uh, Medusa Pictures when I first met her. And she knew nothing about digital. She knew a shitload about marketing and, and an absolute ton about movie marketing. Um, and she'd be bringing me into the early brainstorm meeting. She'd be showing me the strategies, talking P&L, talking about kind of, um, you know, personas and, and segmentation and letting me get involved with that. So for her, I dedicated to her for kind of showing me that I, actually marketing is something I might be able to do and that I can offer something to it. And um, actually for being a really good friend and an absolute legend in the, in the industry. Fantastic. Well, firstly, John, thank you uh, for those kind words. Uh, honestly, that, that means a lot. And I would also like to echo everything positive that you could ever say about Jem Higgins. She is a remarkable young lady. Um, but this episode is very proudly dedicated to Debbie Rowland. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us, John. Uh, as a final call to action, everyone can find links to everything we've discussed, hashtag adventures of hat primarily, uh, eat your greens, uh, the Baroque cycle. Um, how else can they get more John Lyons? Um, so I mean, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, John Lyons. Um, yeah, follow me there, connect with me if, if, if you're going to bother to tell me why you want to connect with me. So there's lots of people just kind of racking up. Uh, where, where, where I really like to hang out is Twitter. So at Johnny Ego on Twitter. Um, at Johnny Ego and various other places, but that that's where I, I really kind of um, like to get to know people and, and actually genuinely feel that I've become a much better marketer through getting to know so many people in the industry who are so brilliant and um, actually getting to the point of having conversations with them. And that's why I love Twitter. It's a two-way social network. It's It shouldn't be for those kind of um, platform broadcasting twats it's it, it's great to get in and co communicate with people yeah well said um well, well fuck those people fuck, fuck those guys giles fuck those guys them. yeah you're absolutely right you're absolutely right well um we'll include links to both your linkedin and, and twitter profile also but john I've, I've enjoyed this even more than i thought i would so thank you so much for finding time to chat today mate no you're welcome it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun it's been a lot of fun but you know you always are yeah uh, um, and thank you to everyone listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do share it and review the pod. We value your support more than I can articulate. Keep the questions and guest requests coming in. To get in touch, it's easy to find Gasp online. You can check out CTA pod on Instagram and email hello at calltoaction.co. Try and I try and I try.